The Clinical Hypertension Fellowship. The course is unique, flagship, only online program delivering up-to-date knowledge and evidence-based patient-oriented experience in the principles and practice of clinical hypertension. It is structured as three modules, 24 credit hours each. Each module will be delivered over a 14-week period. The Clinical Hypertension Fellowship is open for all physicians, particularly internal medicine, family medicine, cardiology, endocrinology, and nephrology, along with clinical pharmacists dealing with hypertensive patients. The fellowship program is delivered by international hypertension experts in the form of online lectures, MCQs, clinical case scenarios, journal clubs, workshops, and webinars. All scientific materials will be taught and learned synchronously via smart platform. Upon completion of the fellowship, the participants will be able to understand the basic mechanisms, causes of primary and secondary hypertension, along with the diagnostic workup and explain its causes, signs, symptoms, and diagnostic workup. Develop cost-effective diagnostic and management strategies. Explore the latest treatment options of hypertension, including lifestyle modifications, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. Review key translational research evidence related to hypertension. Apply knowledge of hypertension to real-world cases. Provide health education on hypertension and its prevention. Receive an American Association of Continuing Medical Education certification for completion of your fellowship. For more info, visit worldkidneyacademy.org. For registration, please scan the QR code. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar, The Challenges in Clinical Hypertension. And welcome to all of you also to our uh, Hypertension Fellowship. We have great speakers today, and it will be between his presentation, discussion, and the literature review. We have uh, Dr. Um, Brian is going uh, um, to give us a um, very brief description of a common case of resistant hypertension. Professor uh, Brian uh, Rayner is from South Africa. Then um, Professor Colodio Borghi from Italy and Dr. Uh, Berzad from Bangladesh are going to help with, uh, to facilitate the case discussion. And uh, uh, Professor Erica Jones is going to give us a literature review how to manage and deal with uh, severe and resistant hypertension. Then we'll have another case, an interesting case of uh, resistant severe hypertension in dialysis patient presented by Professor Mahmoud Mustafi from Bangladesh. Again, Professor Colodio is going to do the case discussion. Then we'll finish by a literature review about renovascular hypertension and patients with chronic kidney disease. This will be presented by Professor Mustaba Kadri. Here are our um, hypertension board. Uh, I am Amr Hosseini, uh, Professor of Nephrology at the University of Kentucky. Again, Professor Brian Rainer, Claudio Borghi, uh, Professor Ibtissam Ali from Sudan, Professor Barazad from Bangladesh, Professor Mustaba Qadri from Pakistan, Professor Erika Jones from South Africa, Professor Mahmoud Mustafi from Bangladesh, and Professor Ruan Kruger from South Africa. Again, the fellowship and this webinar is sponsored by the World Kidney Academy. We are a community. We are trying to help 
nephrologist and uh, to improve the patient care and the quality and the standard of uh, uh, patient care. So please join us if you, have, if you haven't yet. We have a WhatsApp group and here is the link. I'm going to uh, put it in the chat box if you are interested to join the World Kidney Academy WhatsApp group. That would be great. We have a landing page also, and we have pages on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So please follow up, uh, follow us. And we have almost every couple of weeks free webinars, and we have also short and long-term uh, fellowship program and educational activity. For everyone who is attending our uh, webinar today, you can get 15% discount for um, a participation in the Clinical Hypertension Fellowship is three modules, 14 weeks each, and a total of 10 months. If you are interested, I'm going to put the registration and application link in the chat box. So you can go ahead and register. And here you can get 15% discount using a promo code of early bird. Our next uh, webinar is scheduled uh, for Wednesday, March 6th for BMGMT. This is a free international webinar. It will be an orientational meeting. We'll give you more details about our Clinical Hypertension Fellowship. And here I'm going to stop. And um, first case, will be presented by Professor Brian, and I will let Professor Erica to introduce uh, Professor Brian. Thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. It's really great to speak. Um, so Professor Brian Rayner is a hypertension specialist. He's a well-respected clinician from South Africa and has work been working in clinical medicine for very many years. He has... Um, been the um, past president of the Southern African Hypertension Society and has led the our salt lowering program um, and legislation in South Africa. He was head of the clinical unit for nephrology and hypertension at Hudeskia Hospital and the University of Cape Town and is now working as the emeritus professor and senior scholar through University of Cape Town. He's currently involved in clinical trials and student research and supervision as well as mentoring junior colleagues um, and a large number of people he provides support and volunteers in our clinical services as well. Thank, thank you very much, Erica. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants. It's a wonderful privilege to be here to present the first case. I'm from Cape Town, and that's my hospital called the Hrutisku Hospital which is a Dutch name for meaning a big barn. Anyway, let's start with the case. The case is a Mrs. KC, a 51-year-old female with a healthy ass lifestyle and not overweight, normal BMI. In 2018, she had normal blood pressures, 120, 80, 2019, 135.85. In January 2021, she had a lifestyle medical and formed no health problems, blood pressure, 130, 82. In April 21, I'm going to pre Assessment for insertion of Mirena for menorrhagia. She was told by the nurse her blood pressure extremely high. I was really reassured and probably stress related. There's no comment from the anesthetist. In May 21, as part of BP screening program, I took a blood pressure with a validated device and it was a 210 over 105 millimeters of mercury repeatedly. She had a two year history of chronic daily severe occipital headaches, which she had taken paracetamol two, one gram twice daily. She thought it was stress-related. This woke at night and occurred on waking in the morning. She had good effort tolerance. She was on treatment for anxiety, depression, with venaflaxin. At 21, she developed severe UTIs, which were investigated, and the ureters were re-implanted for presumed reflux neuropathy. No further documentation. The mother had hypertension, heart failure at 72, and her father died of um, a, probably a pulmonary embolus following a hip fracture. On examination, she appeared a fit, fit healthy, middle-aged female. The pertinent findings were pressure load over apex, allowed A2 with a S4 hot sound. The urine dipstick showed a trace protein and no blood. At investigation at that time, a hemoglobin was 
Sodium 139, potassium 3.7, creatinine 70 with the EGFR 66, 86 mL per minute. HbA1c normal. Albumin creatinine ratio is 9.7. That's A2 albuminuria according to the KDPO guidelines. The lipogram was relative normal, and she had a positive aldosterone renin ratio of a renin 4.6 and an aldo 594. The CT scan showed bilateral renal scarring worse on the right compared to the left and no adrenal adenoma. The ECG um, showed left ventricular hypertrophy based on the Sokolilian criteria. She did not undergo echocardiography. These are the other criteria for LVH that you may be interested in. And so for discussion, I thought, and the discussions can go the route they want to go, is what about blood pressure management? Was this incorrect? Or was there a bad case of mast hypertension? How do you classify severe hypertension? Detection and classification of hypertensive mediated organ damage, exacerbating factors for hypertension, potential secondary causes, and how should we initially treat patient and this patient with hypertension? So I'm going to stop there and try and stop sharing and hand it over to my discussants. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Brian. This is, I think, very nice case. Apparently, it's pretty simple because this uh, lady has a normal, almost normal blood pressure values up to two years ago. But after that, something happened and everything changed. So I think, uh, first of all, there is a strong suspect that she could have some secondary form of hypertension because the she's young. Actually, she's 51, but probably uh, we would expect that she could have some trouble with blood pressure before. And uh, the, in the many times that she measured the blood pressure, the values were absolutely normal. So I think that the first point that we have to try to clarify if, is if there are some evidence, there is some evidence that uh, this patient can have secondary hypertension. I think uh, actually uh, the most important point is that Apparently, she had some troubles in the structure of the kidney. And uh, probably it could be some parenchyma renal disease or something like that that could have uh, increased the blood pressure values. Can you give us some more information about this patient for this topic, some history of pielonephritis, glomerulonephritis, or something like that? You are mute. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, there was, the, the history was came out, she definitely had reflux nephropathy, probably develops a scarring of that kidney from ascending infection from the reflux, but there's no evidence of glomerulonephritis. Okay, okay. So actually, we have excluded the possibility that we are um, dealing with a, a, a parenchymal renal disease and the primary renal disease. So probably this could be actually a potential resistant hypertension. But basically, uh, you know much better than me that the definition of uh, severe or resistant hypertension is mainly based on the resistance to the antihypertensive treatment. And for these patients, apparently, we don't have any specific information about the treatment or if she was treated with some drugs and uh, she was resistant to treatment. So I think the first point we have to <clears throat> discuss and to manage is first of all, try to define if the blood pressure is really high and if it's really high uh, uh, over time. It's pretty clear that uh, from the AKG that there is some evidence of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So the presence of hypertension uh, apparently short uh, lasting hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy could clearly support uh, severe and resistant hypertension. But I think we, we should maybe uh, need some 24 hour blood pressure measurement just to see what's going on, just to see if there is some 
uh, uh, negative uh, uh, evidence of uh, uh, poor dipping of blood pressure during the night that would support the diagnosis of uh, uh, renal-based uh, hypertension. And if we have a confirmation that the blood pressure is really high, I think that the next thing we have to do is try to directly go to the uh, antihypertensive treatment because the blood pressure values that the, the patient measure were pretty high and uh, probably we have to immediately improve the blood pressure control, not only for the prevention of the major cardiovascular complication, but also the prevention of the progression of target organ damage, the cardiac target organ damage, and the renal target organ damage. I don't know if uh, we can try to connect the headache and the problems of the patient with headache with the increase in blood pressure. Actually, it's possible, even whether everybody knows that not always there is a correlation between the level of symptoms and, in particular, the onset of headache and the development of severe hypertension. But basically, if a patient is, does not have headache previously and the symptoms are, uh, uh, let's say, raising up at the same time that there is some let's say, increase in the blood pressure values, probably we have to pay a lot of attention to these uh, 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 symptoms and not just to consider a problem of pain or a problem of uh, primary headache, but also consider the possibility that could be the consequence of uh, the elevated blood pressure values. But... Thank you. Maybe now the only problem now is the treatment. From my side, I think I would exclude actually as a first line treatment, the calcium channel blocker because the patient has headache and I would try to treat, I would try with a drug inhibiting the renal angiosensin system, pay a lot of attention to the changes in serum creatinine, mm -hmm. and GFR, and the uh, diuretic and probably a beta blocker that could be helpful in improving blood pressure control and at the same time controlling headache. This is at least my position, is, is what I would like to do in a patient like this. That's all. Very of nice. Thank you so much, Professor Corodio. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Brian now is going to introduce uh, Professor Erica for her literature review about uh, severe hypertension, um, the management and diagnostic approach. Um, I would like to introduce Professor Erica Jones, who I've known for a very long time. She joined my department as a PhD student and did her PhD on genetics of severe hypertension in African people, particularly related to the ENAC mutations. And she's uh, done, then done her clinical nephrology fellowship and entered, became a consultant in the, in the kidney unit and the hypertension unit. And when I retired, she took over the reins of the hypertension clinic, and she's been flourishing there and developing research in hypertension. And she's now been appointed uh, ad hominem to professorship. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Erica to talk on severe hypertension. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Claudia. Thank you both for your presentation and the discussion around the, the case. Um, I think but I don't have a lot more to add to what um, the two of you have um, provided, but let's run through this. And um, I'll start off with looking at our, just a brief summary of our patient, who's a 51-year-old female with supposedly a previously normal blood pressure, but now very high. Um, she also has headaches and anxiety for which she's on treatment. She has a background history of uh, urinary tract infections requiring autotransplantation and a family history of hypertension. And of concern in this patient is she has established hypertension-mediated organ damage in the form of LVH, which, which is seen on the echo as well as on clinical examination. She's got albuminuria. And then on further investigations, her aldosterone-renin ratio is elevated. She's got the scar scarring on her uh, of her kidneys, 
And then bear in mind that actually paracetamol and venlafaxine can rise, or SSRIs can increase the blood pressure. And when we're treating patients with high blood pressures, particularly extremely high blood pressures like this lady, we really must be aware of what other medications or other substances people are taking because they can contribute to very poorly controlled blood pressures or to severe emergencies. So I think that the first thing we need to really discuss with this patient is thinking back to her um, previous uh, blood pressure measurements. Were they done correctly? Now, in general, when they're done incorrectly, we see white coat hypertension. So the blood pressure is high in the office, but not so high um, at home. Now, in this patient, if anything, it would have been the other way around, where her blood pressure might have been missed, so masked hypertension. Either way, we must make sure that we are doing the blood pressure correctly, and the ASH guidelines create a really lovely picture that we can use. Importantly, to take a number of readings and get the average of stable readings. And then when we make the diagnosis, and we're doing this in South Africa, but um, these are based on the ESH guidelines. And I think that there are um, useful guidelines for making the diagnosis of hypertension. So the office blood pressure, 140, 90, greater than or equal to. Um, awake blood pressure should be less than 135, 85. Asleep, less than 128, 70. And the overall 24-hour blood pressure should be less than 130, 80. And to make a diagnosis of hypertension at home, it's 135, 85 and or greater than that. So these are the diagnostic criteria, but we can divide our patients into different grades of hypertension. And as mentioned, this patient actually fits into grade three hypertension with a systolic greater than 180. But basically the increments are 20 millimeters of mercury from optimal to grade three, um, and 10 millimeters of mercury for diastolic. So it's important to really note that about a quarter and about a fifth of patients will have a white coat effect or um, masked hypertension. And it's particularly um, relevant for white coat hypertension when the blood pressure is um, less than 160, 110. If it's greater than that, it's more likely to be diagnostic. So. Bear in mind that white coat hypertension, which is not what our patient has, um, is, is actually a risk factor um, for chronic hypertension. So 2.5 times the risk for developing chronic hypertension. And it's very important to make sure of this, to make note of this, because in time, you're probably going to have to screen these patients more regularly. So for our patient, the question is, did she have masked hypertension previously? Or was this a technique problem? Or is it a new onset hypertension? And I think that there are a couple of pointers that there's a degree of chronicity to this hypertension. She's had headaches for two years. And headaches are such an iffy sign when it comes to the diagnosis of hypertension or as a symptom of hypertension. But in someone with very high blood pressures, that can be there and we do need to be aware of it. But importantly, when we look at her ECG and her urine dipsticks, she has proteinuria and LVH. So she has established hypertension-mediated organ damage. And this is evident in the seriously high blood pressures that were seen with, her, with Prof. Rainer. And the question is, five months prior to her screening with Prof. Rainer, did she have actually those blood pressures? Were those real blood pressures? Or was the um, measurement kind of faulty? And for some reason, either um, the patient, um, the, the, the equipment wasn't um, good or blood pressure wasn't taken correctly. We do have to think of these things because sometimes we don't want to make a diagnosis, particularly in younger, healthier patients. We don't want to make a diagnosis of hypertension. So headaches and hypertension, as I said, a very iffy symptom. Um, it's classically uh, in relation to a, an acute rise in blood pressure with a diastolic that goes to greater than 120. So this is kind of a hypertensive urgency picture. And generally, the headache will resolve with blood pressure control. But some patients talk about these chronic bilateral pulsatile blood pressures, and it's usually across the temporal area and the frontal area. 
and might be mistaken for tension headache. They are very similar and sometimes actually can't be told apart and sometimes feed into each other. Treating the blood pressure, controlling the blood pressure may improve things. Um, but just bear in mind that actually you might need to uh, address tension headaches at the same time. So looking for hypertension mediated organ damage, I think it's really important to look for the more subtle signs to start off with, especially early on and particularly in younger patients. And we need to look for other signs. So obviously we've got ECGs and we've got urine dipsticks, but we need to look at the retina and then other things like ankle brach brachial index, non-hemodynamically significant arterial plaque. And recently we've got pulse wave velocity and looking for arterial stiffness. And I think it's quite important to think of these as potentially early markers that actually our patient does have hypertension. And in our patient, we're actually seeing um, that she has established albuminuria and ECG criteria for LVH. So when we're evaluating hypertension, I think it's always important to go back to our patient, reevaluate, rethink, particularly in a patient who's maybe been through a couple of visits and we're not 100% sure whether this is a new onset hypertension or um, if the patient maybe has um, had chronic hypertension that's been untreated or missed. So are we treating our patients appropriately? Are we looking at adherence? Um, are we addressing, addressing lifestyle challenges? Do we have drugs that are interfering or causing hypertension? And then obviously some basic hypertension, basic investigations. But importantly, when you're looking, when you have certain patients, you really need to have a good secondary workup and approach to working these patients up. So these are patients who are under 40 with grade two hypertension, people in their childhood or with resistant hypertension, hypertension emergency, and grade three hypertension, which is our patient, with, and especially people who have severe hypertension-mediated organ damage. These are the patients you really need to make sure you do a thorough um, secondary workup. Obviously, it's really important to address adherence, which might not have been an issue in our patient, but it is a common problem when patients who are presenting with severe hypertension that they've defaulted treatment. And while patients will not always admit to um, not taking their treatment, there are some um, tricks to try and establish whether they actually are. And I think importantly, it's it's really important not to appear like you're judging people for not taking their treatment um, and try and work with them to try and address the problems when it comes to not taking. Sometimes you will need to um, do chemical testing to um, look for uh, the levels either in the urine or in the blood, and I use this quite regularly. Um, and it changes the way I chat to patients when I've got um, levels that are non-therapeutic. Once you've established that your patient is adherent, then and they've got severe hypertension or reason to work them up, um, then you might need to think about secondary causes. And secondary um, hypertension really is to some degree dependent on the age of your presentation. So something like the vascular diseases, aortic or um, renovascular hypertension and in the fibromuscular dysplasia, these are often in the younger patients. Once you get renal parenchymal disease, that's across the spectrum. But renovascular hypertension um, or atherosclerotic disease tends to be in your older patients. And then you've got your genetic complications, which are obviously younger. And then um, the endocrine causes, um, which maybe tend to be in... Um, maybe not as young as uh, small children, but young a uh, young adults or adolescents going up to the younger the younger person less than sixty five years of age. So this is my basic approach to addressing. And very importantly, as um, Prof Borgi has said, we need an ABPM on this lady. Twenty four hour blood pressure really helps to rule in or out mask hypertension. Um, and white coat hypertension and excludes hypertension in many young patients. So I think that if you're making a diagnosis of hypertension in a young person, you cannot do it without a 24-hour blood pressure. 
and then importantly looking for your secondary causes. And like we found in our patient, she had renal dis um, she had evidence of uh, reflux nephropathy on the KUB. But she also has evidence of hyperaldosteronism, which then points to kind of ways that you can treat this patient. Um, so those are the basics, but then there are certain pictures that might um, point towards certain things like um, obesity and non-dipping status might be um, obstructive sleep apnea, HIV is associated with non-dipping, obviously chronic kidney disease, but that should be part of your basic studies. Then the others, like um, hyperparathyroidism, that's a rare cause of hypertension, um, Cushing syndrome, you might need a biopsy to look for um, glomerulonephritis, echoes to rule out uh, a, um, coarctation of the aorta, and then rarely you might need an MRA, um, an angiogram. And then I've put in pale, paler colors because I think this is often over-tested for is looking for urine metanephrines. And this is a rare cause of hypertension. It's not always associated with um, severe hypertensive emergencies. It can be a chronic hypertension picture, but they almost always have other symptoms. So in an asymptomatic patient, this really needs to be a last resort. So for our patient, um, factors that were exacerbating her hypertension include hyperaldosteronism. She did have a low potassium and a high aldarenin ratio. And then the renal scarring is seen on her um, KUB. But don't forget paracetamol and the SSRIs. So paracetamol is shown to rise the blood, uh, systolic blood pressure by four to five millimeters mercury. The understanding, it's not quite clear why, but it could be related to sodium. Um, that is in the paracetamol. And then similarly, the um, serotonin um, agonist, um, SSRIs can cause hypertension. So maybe change this. So specific treatment for our patient uh, would be using an ACE1 ARB. And I think that this would be important in the setting of proteinuria and LVH. I agree with Prof. Borgi. I would have her on a calcium channel blocker, and that would be my first line combination. However, I would have her on spironolactone because she has hyperaldosteronism. And then, as I say, take away um, contributing drugs, salt, this can um, contribute towards headache and the blood pressure. So very important to introduce a low salt diet and obviously all lifestyle measures. And this um, is my flow diagram for um, treating severe blood, high blood pressures, so grade two and up. So if the blood pressure is greater than 160, 100, but there's no hypertension mediated organ damage, she's asymptomatic and the blood pressure is less than 180, 110. You can repeat in a, in a couple of weeks. But if the blood pressure is greater than 180, the patient has symptoms or there's evidence of hypertension mediated organ damage, these patients need treatment immediately and, and fairly um, um, urgent follow-up, so within two weeks, up titrating as need be, um, but bear in mind that um, antihypertensives do take six to eight weeks to have their full effect. Obviously, um, if there's a hypertensive urgency or emergency, you might you will have to treat them either in hospital or rather expeditiously. And then those that need intensive management are those with established cardiovascular disease with a lower GFR, a high 10-year cardiovascular score, or if they're older than 75 years of age. So that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Um, and just a reminder, this is the um, link to the World Academy, Kidney Academy Hypertension Fellowship. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Erica. Um, I saw in the chat box, uh, somebody is are doubting that uh, headache is one of the symptoms of hypertension. Another comment is um, that hypertension is doesn't have symptoms and it's just a number. Can you please comment? So I think there's a lot of doubt with regards um, headache and hypertension. 
as I said, it's it's classically associated with a severe acute rise in blood pressure. Um, the papers that I was reading um, to describe the, the headache and hypertension, they're very iffy. Um, the thing is, some patients turn to me and say, you know what? I know when my blood pressure is up because I get that same headache time and again. You know, sometimes we have to listen to our patients and they, they usually write at that um, case and then you tell them to take their treatment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's something you just have to work with. And I don't know that we're going to get clear, solid e evidence with regards to headaches and hypertension. Um, yes, I agree. Blood pressure, hypertension is a diagnosed by a number, but it obviously has um, cardiovascular outcomes. And the higher the number, the worse the cardiovascular. And, and, and usually, I agree, patients are asymptomatic, which is why it's called the silent killer. Very nice. Thank you so much. Why not CPC and the diuretic? Calcium channel blockers, I think, and diuretics. This is a question from Dr. Komar. So I don't think I would use the diuretics in this patient. I think that as Prof. Borgi said, um, with her headaches and her other symptoms, um, a, a calcium channel blocker really would be of um, use. Um, and then she needs the ACE inhibitor. She has established um, proteinuria. She has LVH, and that's an independent indication for the, the RAS blockade. Can I have a short comment to the wonderful lecture of Erica about headache? Um, I know that headache is a non, non, let's say, specific symptoms of hypertension. But if you look at the results of uh, treatment, of trials of treatment, uh, when you see the patient which are shifting from high blood pressure to normal blood pressure, what is very common is that there is a significant reduction in the rate of headache. So even whether we are not so sure that headache means hypertension. When you improve the blood pressure control, the rate of headache decreases. So I think that there is something is something that should be taken always into account. Very good, very good. I think you'll ask the question about baxodrostat. What is the role of baxodrostat in secondary hypertension? I think um, baxodrostat um has got phase two trials uh, and um, we will have to see the phase three trial outcomes, but there's certainly a lot of hope um, with regards to Baxterostat um, in treating resistant hypertension. Thank you so much, Erica. Professor Mushtaba is going to introduce uh, um, Professor uh, Mahmoud Mustafi. Thank you, Professor Amr. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Mahmoud Mustafi here, who is an FCPS from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, Bangladesh, and an FRCP, and also a fellow of the International Society of Nephrology. He's a veteran brigadier general of the Bangladesh Army, who retired as the head of nephrology and internal medicine from the Bangladesh Army. He trained in nephrology in CMC Velour, AIMS Kochi, Ashwini Institute, and AFMC of India, as well as Prince Sultan Referral Hospital in Saudi Arabia. He is currently the head of nephrology, Gunas Tashtaya, Somaj with Tech <laughs> Medical <laughs> And he is also the immediate past vice president of the Bangladesh Renal Association, former co-chair faculty of medicine, Bangladesh College of Physician Surgeons, and chair Mustafi Kidney Center, editor-in-chief, journal of Bangladesh College of Physician Surgeons, and former editor-in-chief of Bangladesh Renal Journal and Armed Forces Medical College Journal. He has written two nephrology uh, book chapters and more than 100 publications he has to his credit. And he's also had a lifetime health service gold medal award from the Bangladesh Renal Association and Shere Bangla Foundation. So it's my great, great pleasure to have uh, Professor Brigadier General Retired Pamun Mustafi uh, present this case that I'll be discussing after Professor uh, Claudia Bobby. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mustafa Kadri. <clears throat> uh, very good afternoon from Bangladesh. So in the next few minutes, I'll be discussing with you about the management of a endless renal disease patient who presented 
suffered a lot with a resistant hypertension. Uh, our case, a 55-year-old male having regular maintenance hemodialysis gets frequent outpatient department consultations for uncontrolled high blood pressure, leading to several hospitalizations over the last six months with different hypertensive emergencies. He remains dyspneic even on the night following the dialysis. His past, past history is significant for a PCI in his left antidepressing artery two years back. His regular medications include prazosin 5 mg twice daily, nifedipine 20 mg twice daily, losartan 50 mg twice daily, carvedilol 25 mg twice daily, furosemide 80 mg twice daily, and erythropoietin 10,000 units subcutaneously twice weekly, that is 20,000. He is 170 centimeter in height and body weight was 82 kilogram with a BMI of 31.2. His radial pulses were 50 beats per minute. Dorsal spedis were not palpable. He was distinct with respiratory rate of 26. His pre-hemodialysis blood pressure was 200 by 116 and post-dialysis his BP was 200 by 120. Despite all these medications and regular dialysis twice weekly, his blood pressure remained in the same range of 180 to 106 to 218 by 1 to 2 millimeter of mercury. So what one should, what I should do or you should do next? So the first thing that we have adjusted his medication. We have increased the maximum level of prazosin to five milligram four times daily, nifedipine 20 milligrams four times daily, losartan 50 milligram twice daily. As he was having bradycardia, so carbidol was reduced to 12.5 milligram twice daily, and furosemide was increased to the maximum possible dose, 200 milligram thrice daily. And many of you know that erythropoietin increases blood pressure in many situations. So we have reduced the dose of erythropoietin to 5,000 units twice weekly. He was dialyzed daily for five days for a target dry weight of 72 kilogram. On achieving the target dry weight of 72 kilo, he was now on maintenance hemodialysis thrice weekly in a week. With the adjustment of dry weight, maximizing the antihypertensive and diuretics, his urine volume increased. There is no evidence of fluid overload now. His body weight is maintained at dry weight and his biochemistry blood was almost normal, acceptable with electrolyte creatinine and hemoglobin. His BP, but unfortunately, even after all these measures, his blood pressure remains 190 by 110 millimeter of mercury. And he was still getting pre-hemodialysis breathless almost every day, though there is no evidence of fluid overload. So what we do, we back to our original teaching, back to physical examination, have a detailed physical examinations of the patients. And fortunately, we found there is bilateral renal artery brui. A Doppler study was done in the renal vessel, suggested that bilateral renal artery stenosis could be there, and a renal angiography was subsequently done. So here you see that there is definitely narrowing of the renal arteries on the both side. So finally, the patient underwent renal angioplasty, and the stenting was done on the same string on the both side. Subsequently, the patient's blood pressure is now very much normalized with carbidolol 12.5 mg twice daily, furosemide 200 mg thrice daily, and prazosin 5 mg twice daily. He remains comfortable with the maintenance of dialysis. There is no episode of pulmonary edema or hypertensive emergency over a period of subsequent six months. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. So thank you very much.
Professor Mustafi, I think is a wonderful case and is a wonderful example that even whether there is a primary target organ damage, severe target organ, organ damage in a patient, and you believe that the, the renal disease is the main cause of the hypertension, probably you have always to look for some evidence of additional atherosclerosis. I think this was uh, probably could be suspected in this patient because there was uh, no uh, pulse in the in the uh, in the fold, and I think there were there were a lot of evidence of a poor peripheral circulation. So, as it usually happened in this patient, probably there is a strong stimulus for the atherosclerotic disease, and you find out a couple of of uh, uh, strong lesions and very narrow lesions in the renal arteries. So. I think the main uh, point of these uh, clinical case is that you don't have to consider that the renal damage of the target organ damage per se can be responsible for the, uh, let's say, resistance of hypertension. You have also always to look for additional causes of uh, resistant hypertension. In this case, it was the uh, double uh, uh, stenosis of the renal artery, but of course, other cases should be looked for. And it's pretty clear that in this particular situation, the renal stenosis was responsible for most of the resistance of uh, blood pressure control. And when the, 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 there was an improvement in the, in the kidney flow, there was a reduction in blood pressure that was very well controlled with just uh, three drugs when compared to the high number of drugs before. Actually, the only thing I, I would have done differently uh, was uh, probably using uh, uh, another kind of beta blocker, but it's my personal opinion. And of course it opened the discussion since you are uh, going to use an alpha blocking drugs. And I think that using a drug with both uh, beta blockers and vasodilating effect probably uh, could uh, in some way overcome, overcome to the vasodilating effect of the alpha blockade and at the same time, probably using a more selective beta blockers, like for example, uh, uh, nabivolol, or maybe even better bisoprolol, you would uh, have some uh, more remarkable uh, downregulation of the sympathetic nervous system that you know very well is usually enhanced and its activity is pretty much increased in patients with renal disease and in patients with renal failure. But I think that's all. I think you did a wonderful job. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Mustafi and Professor Colodio. I just have a couple of questions here. Um, first, we know that uh, uh, young ladies with uh, severe intractable hypertension uh, who has um, fibromuscular dysplasia are benefiting from stenting or uh, surgical intervention. Um, Anyway, but again, patient with severe, um, you know, systemic uh, atherosclerotic renal artery disease. Uh, personally, I wouldn't think they are responding at the same rate as um, you know young ladies, middle age, with usually proximal, not distal, stenosis unilateral rather than bilateral. But here, the patient is bulbous. The patient has severe atherosclerotic uh, uh, disease. So I wouldn't, I mean, I was surprised that this patient actually benefited. And again, by the end of the day, you know, you do the procedure if the patient responds that successful procedure, whatever, you know, the background is. So this patient already proved that this is a successful, um, you know, procedure because um, the patient responded very, very well after the angioplasty. But would you, think is the same way. And my other question, if the kidneys are already hypoperfused, patient on dialysis for years, and you wouldn't anticipate that this kidney is, uh, you know, still perfused, would um, the renal artery stenosis, the anatomical stenosis, have the same impact as uh, very well perfused kidneys? Claudio? Uh, it, it is, I think the, the, the question was was for uh, 
Professor Musati. Now, I think that probably in this particular case, I, I, I agree with you that probably open the arteries is not always the, the best solution. And in many cases, so we have studies showing that there is no improvement in blood pressure. But in this particular situation, I do believe that the atherosclerotic disease was widespread in, in, this, uh, in this patient. So probably uh, the situation was not just related to the, the renal arteries. And so there is a possibility that that uh, renal stenosis, uh, artery stenosis occurred late in the history of uh, 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 renal disease. And so it could have been responsible for, a, let's say, a worsening of the renal function at the same time for a, an increase in blood pressure. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Claudio. Exactly you said, uh, the patient was on dialysis for last uh, two years. At that time, patient has not that much of resistant hypertension. Subsequently, his uh, coronary artery was found to be atherosclerosed. His uh, medial, uh, both the dorsal spades artery were not palpable. So all this indicates that he has developed atherosclerotic narrowing of the arteries. And that's really to renal artery atherosclerosis also leading to uh, that refractory hypertension, which could have been negotiated. And the blood pressure has returned to his original level. Thank you for the query and for the good comments from Professor Colgio. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Mustafa Qadri and uh, Professor Mamoun is going to introduce Professor Mustafa. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my <clears throat> proud privilege to one of the legends in the field of nephrology. He is nothing other than Professor K. S. Mustafa Qadri, who has done his um, <clears throat> graduation from Medical College of Karachi, Pakistan, and residency he has done in the Wright State University, Dayton, Ohio. He has done his fellowship in nephrology in the University of Pittsburgh. He has grips in his two author of two books, and he's a Harvard certified clinical research fellow. He has 116 manuscripts to published. He is the chief academic officer of the World Kidney Academy and the present academic director of the cl clinical hypertension course. He has four, <clears throat> he is fourth time diplomat of the American Board of uh, Boards of, for both internal medicine and nephrology. <clears throat> Currently, he is working as the head of nephrology, Maruf International Hospital, Islamabad. He also chairs the Pakistan Society of Nephrology Research Committee. And he is the chief editor of Comstech Handbook of Randomized Control Trials. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa Kadri from Pakistan has been trained in states and a very much dependable uh, fellow of the World Kidney Academy, Professor Kadri. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mamoun. I don't deserve any of what you've said, but uh, I think moving right, uh, right ahead, uh, again, uh, we have the, the second case, which is resistant hypertension in end-stage renal disease. So the questions that one may uh, reflect at this point is, uh, do we need to have uh, the same kind of uh, home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home readings or uh, a specific uh, non-observed uh, office automated uh, BP readings or in-center hemodialysis measurements are continue to be practical. So I think that's one question. Uh, then what are the factors we, we need to consider to target home blood pressures of less than 140 by 90 millimeters mercury, for instance? Uh, what is the role of volume status and interdialytic weight gains and what were they in this particular patient? Initially, it was twice a week uh, on dialysis and then subsequently three times a week, what were the interdialytic weight gains? Uh, what about uh, the resistance, uh, resistant hypertension in dialysis population despite intensification, volume control and lowering of dry weight? Is us using a low sodium dialysate an option? Uh, the issue of polypharmacy in dialysis and state renal disease is well known and so the adherence can always be an issue. Uh, similarly, the uh, dialyzability of medications, some medications may get dialyzed. Uh, and, and so what's the optimum timing of using medications? Uh, of course, uh, erythropoietin, besides its direct vasoconstrictor role on the afferent arteriole, it also has uh, some uh, stimulation of the sympathetic drive and other mechanisms. 
uh, other medications uh, used in the dialysis population, uh, you know, the, that we need to be looking at in all that uh, list that patients are on. And then what is the original cause of the end-stage renal disease? I mean, is it the chicken or the egg? Which came first? So with the previous history of coronary angioplasty, recurrent dyspnea, and poor dorsalis speedus pulse, uh, of course, these are patients who are referred to a very large dialysis unit. So a lot of times, you know, all these examinations are done elsewhere, and they come in to this particular unit, which dialyzes 150 patients a day. So you would expect a lot of those patients come in, and, and examinations subsequently, obviously, cannot be done on each and every patient uh, the way you'd like to do. But then uh, the uh, the issue of if it's not there and it's not obvious, go back to the history, go back to the physical diagnosis. So of course, uh, you know, so the, if there are five areas which always uh, need to be looked at in any hypertensive, the brain and this cognition, the eyes and the fundoscopy, the heart and as, uh, S4 or S3 as the case may be, uh, or aortic stenosis, or what are the additional factors which may need to be addressed when somebody is treating hypertension. And of course, when you're looking at kidneys, they may be palpable if you're looking at polycystics and, and the arteries. So the peripheral arteries and the bruies, whether they are the carotid bruies or the bruies in the aortic area or the renal bruies. So these are all some things that I think we need to uh, always uh, recall uh, that we can always go back to the physical diagnosis. And what's the role of vascular revascularization for renal artery stenosis, particularly in this particular, uh, in, this, in, this, in this patient? So uh, just going ahead. So uh, hypertension is extremely common in the dialysis population and uh, over 50 to 60% of patients, uh, and in some reports up to 85%, uh, on hemodialysis are hypertensive, and so are patients on peritoneal dialysis. They usually have some residual renal function, a little better maintained, so they may be less hypertensive. Maybe that's one of the reasons. But uh, in, in one of the multicenter trial of uh, 2,535 2, adult patients uh, with hypertension being defined as one week average pre-dialysis systolic BP measurements of over 150 by 85, or the use of antihypertensive medications, the, the prevalence was about 86%. So uh, Erica has already gone through this, but in our particular case, so this is a 51-year-old gentleman, just about the right age group for the uh, atherosclerotic renal, uh, renal artery stem, uh, renovascular hypertension. So uh, in, the, in terms of pathophysiology in end-stage renal disease, volume expansion and inter interdialytic weight gains uh, are obviously you know, a cause for salt and water expansion um, and which subsequently leads to a rise in cardiac output as well as systemic vascular resistance. And of course, this is uh, supported by studies which, uh, that their uh, volume reduction leads to an improvement in blood pressure control. In fact, in, in, in one study, uh, removal of the excess sodium and targeting dry weight uh, normalized uh, blood pressure in about 60% patients on dialysis. So uh, additional factors uh, in hemodialysis, a sympathetic uh, system, overdrive, uh, activation of the renin angiotensin system, I think that may be a little controversial sometimes that the expanded volume, you may actually suppress it. Arteriosclerosis and accelerated arteriosclerosis is very common in our dialysis population. And of course, changes in endothelium drive vasoactive peptides play a role, and increase in intracellular calcium plays a role, decreases in renal ACE plays a role. So, and in addition to that, erythropoietic uh, uh, agents uh, or stimulating agents and uh, nasal decongestants, NSAIDs, all these things uh, are the usual causes that we need to keep looking for. So, in one, uh, uh, two uh, meta analyses uh, here, I, 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 I describe one enrolled 1679 patients. And uh, the lowering of blood pressure with uh, antihypertensive medications was associated with a decreased risk by about 29% in the cardiovascular events and all cause mortality by about 20%, uh, and cardiovascular mortality by about 29%, although the confidence interval were a little wide, so not very precise. A second meta analysis again looked at five RCTs, 1,202 patients, and compared with placebo or control, the blood pressure lowering with antihypertensive. The therapy resulted in a 31% uh, decreased uh, hazard ratio uh, in terms of cardiovascular events. So the blood pressure monitoring in dialysis, the gold standard is considered to be an ambulatory blood pressure monitor as it correlates best with outcomes, just like we, we, we do for any other hypertensive. 
Uh, however, in this particular case, it's extremely inconvenient for somebody who's coming to in-center dialysis and then having to go through all that uh, at home as well, a fourth day or a fifth day, as you can imagine. Similarly, uh, targeting uh, an interdialytic blood pressure uh, of less than 140, uh, uh, you know, uh, using self-recorded home blood pressure readings, that's uh, recommended. Home blood pressure re readings actually have more prognostic value than the hemodialysis unit recordings. And when you look at the pre-post BP rec recordings and readings that we get excited about in dialysis unit, they correlate weekly with the ambulatory blood pressure monitor or monitoring and, in fact, uh, are associated inversely with outcomes. Uh, there is no uh, very not not a very good association uh, between pre dialysis systolic uh, hypertension with an elevated mortality risk, except for cerebrovascular de uh, death. So we need to still treat that. And then, uh, if you're looking at interdialytic self-measured uh, home blood pressure, if that's not available, then one can target a midweek median intradialytic blood pressure less than 140. Uh, as one strategy. And uh, so there are various ways of, of monitoring uh, blood pressure in dialysis patients. So the main uh, thing is to achieve few volemia, as we talked about, by progressive lowering of the dry weight that was very appropriately done. And in, in terms of antihypersensitive medications, I think uh, the point is very well made. Uh, we have seen uh, in a previous study, atenolol being superior to lisinopril at 12 months in terms of blood pressure control and MACE uh, in, in dialysis populations. So in beta blockers, one strategy could be using something like atenolol 25 milligrams three times a week post-dialysis. Uh, of course, uh, the bisoprolol and, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, could be another agent that one can, uh, or nebulol one can use. Uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers seem to have a better track record. Uh, and again, AS and AR can be used. But then the use of uh, loop diuretics, uh, these days we talk about incremental dialysis, and I think that's, that's pretty appropriate, of course, watching out for ototoxicity. So resistant hypertension, just like anybody else in this population, non-adherence to medications and other medications we talked about, inadequate dialysis, I think that could have been one of the things but then renovascular hypertension is, is, is not uncommon in this population. And when you're looking at the cardiovascular risk of hypertension, so uh, both with uh, grade two as well as stage three, uh, more than uh, the CKD stage four or cardiovascular disease, these uh, basically uh, lead to a very high risk in this population. So it's extremely important to be aware that's the biggest killer. And I think uh, Eric has already gone through some of the factors uh, related to when we should suspect uh, secondary um, uh, hypertension. And I think that that's the same thing in this population. It's all secondary, as we all understand, with end-state renal disease. But then the examination uh, that she also alluded to earlier on is important. And they uh, very appropriately went back and listened for Bruis, and they found that. And they say hindsight is 2020. So Again, the history of angioplasty and stenting and poor dorsalis speedus pulse and all that suggests maybe uh, the chicken indeed came first. And so it was bilateral renal artery stenosis, which uh, may have led to institutional renal disease in this particular case. So it's pretty prevalent, this uh, ancestrotic renovascular disease in the dialysis population. Uh, uh, up to in, you know, so that's about uh, in the general population, 6 to 14%, but also in the dialysis population. And uh, when you're looking at uh, some of the screening tests that were mentioned here, the duplex uh, ultrasound. So uh, remember, a highly sensitive test of a negative rules out disease. So the duplex ultrasound and MRA is a pretty good uh, screening test, which can which can rule out disease. But then, of course, uh, the gold standard is the catheter angiography. And so, in general, if somebody has uncontrolled hypertension in dialysis, uh, you know, sodium restriction and uh, individualizing dialysis sodium probing the dry weight, adequately delivering dialysis, and then going with the, the beta blockers, long-acting calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridines, as well as ACRBs would be the strategy. Um, Atherosclerotic renal vascular disease has been reported in up to 12% of patients with end-state renal disease. And although the initial trials of revascularization, such as the Coral study and others were were criticized or critiqued for uh, for methodological limitations. Several observational studies uh, now uh, suggest that you know it's it's, it's a targeted uh, thing re related to revascularization. So you do have when you have the appropriate patients, uh, some of them who are excluded in those RCTs, 
in terms of blood pressure control, whether it's preservation of renal function or improvement in the symptoms here, in this, pa this patient was going continuously into some form of pulmonary edema on several occasions besides the hypertensive emergencies. And so the current consensus is that was revascularization on top of medical therapy with documented secondary hypertension uh, ca can be done, especially when you have uh, high grade stenosis. So in summary, hypertension is highly prevalent in the dialysis population, CKD4, 5 uh, you know, confer a high risk. It's due to mul multiple uh, etiologies. Challenging the vol volume status and dry weight is essential besides the antihypertensive medication, lifestyle, lifestyle changes. And optimal BP to target is not in the dialysis unit, but based on ABPM, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, or home blood pressure monitoring, which is a, it's like inconvenient. Uh, RAS may be present in up to 12% of the dialysis population, and then we go back to the physical each time and re revascularization is individualized. So I'd like to acknowledge the World Kidney Academy Hypertension Fellowship Ac Academic Board who brought this seminar or webinar to you, the ICOM team, our admin assistants, and then I would refer to you uh, to uh, the 2023 European Society of Hypertension Guidelines for the management of hypertension, which is the latest site out there. You have so many things coming from ISH, uh, ACC, AHA, and of course the JNC series has stopped altogether. Uh, but I think that this, this is the current standard. The only thing is that when you're looking at the hypertension, of course the AHA guidelines have brought the definition down, down um, uh, the, the definitions down, and these stick to the older definitions of more than 140.90 for stage one. So thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you for uh, bearing with me. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mostaba, for this uh, nice literature review. Again, these uh, kind of challenging cases actually um, led uh, to the this uh, fellowship because not all cases of uh, you know hypertension are straightforward. Uh, majority of them are challenging and actually need uh, to. Um, go, um, you know, uh, dig deeper and uh, know exactly what is the mechanism, what is uh, the background, and uh, understand exactly the reasons about the physiology of the hypertension and the treatment modality. Um, there is a question, uh, Professor Mustaba, in the chat box about renal denervation in end stage kidney disease patients and also bilateral nephrectomy in these cases. Would you please um, comment on that? Or should I yeah, comment? I think, uh... Sorry. Yes, please, Professor Kadri, go ahead. So, so renal renal de denervation. Uh, uh, you know, there is some uh, there are some promising, uh, uh, I guess, uh, early trials regarding renal denervation. We don't have the data in there. Normally, they recommend that one should not attempt that uh, below GFR of thirty and forty percent in chronic kidney disease. And in this particular case, uh, you know, after those originals simplicity trials and all, you've got subsequent data to suggest that if you have a more circumferential uh, de denervation, one would be able to, uh, you know, block the sympathetic drive. So, but but in ca cases of end stage renal disease, uh, that uh, you know, normally one would not want the 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 uh, with patients with GFR less than forty or thirty to undergo that. But when you're already on dialysis. As long as uh, one does not have residual renal function, I think that can be done. The data is still out there. Jewelry is still out there. And uh, the second one is bilateral uh, nephrectomy. I think the bilateral nephrectomy era uh, pretty much is over. Uh, you know, uh, for uh, there's nothing that you cannot treat with uh, uh, medications, uh, they say, these days. So uh, if the, unless the patient is going for, for renal transplantation or they have polycystics and other uh, I, I'm not sure if I, if I would subject this particular patient to uh, to bilateral, to obviously an me here. The answer was in the uh, angioplasties. I hope I answered their question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, there is a comment. I just want to want to share one of my experience. One of my patient had nephrectomy uh, because of malignancy. Then he had um, hypertension with three or four drugs. Subsequently, the malignancy appeared in the second kidney also. The second kidney was also removed. And finally, the patient is now with regular dialysis and there is no antihypertensive medication to that patient. So yes, it works, but as Professor Kadri said, nowadays this invasive treatment will be the last choice uh, if the medical treatment fails. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there's another question about the smoking, effect of smoking on blood pressure. 
and use of anti-smoking medication, I think like nicotine or Shantex and dialysis patients. In fact, this nicotine patches and other drugs do not have direct any nephrotoxic effect, but they can raise the blood pressure. They can make the patient's headache, irritable, restless. So in that way that you, you should be pre uh, cautious about pre prescribing these drugs, but directly these are not nephrotoxic. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and there is another question about what stage of CKD um, that can cause high blood pressure because high blood pressure can cause, um, you know, worsen kidney function, but at the same time, CKD by itself can increase blood pressure. So what stage uh, usually hypertension starts to uh, exist? In fact, it, basic disease will determine when the patient will be hypertensive. Many patients will be salt losing. Many patients will be up. Um, uh, there, there will be a lot of uh, polyuria also. Uh, more urinary there. In those patients, there will be no hypertension, like interstitial nephritis. But other glomerulonephritis, obstructive disease, uh, parenchymal disease, they will. They either will be. They will be hypertensive at the outset, or they may develop hypertension later on, maybe in the stage of three. I see one question here, how erythropoietin causes hypertension. So yes, erythropoietin can cause hypertension because it causes influx of calcium inside the smooth vessels. That's why it causes uh, vasoconstriction of the vessels leading to hypertension. Thank you, Professor Amar. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, that's enough because we are 10 minutes over. Um, I will assure everyone who attended the meeting today, we are going to share the recorded video just for your reference if you want to go over it, over it one more time. We are going also to be in contact if you already registered for this webinar. So uh, we will have your database. So we'll be in touch. We'll send you some information about the incoming uh, free webinars and also about the hypertension fellowships and other fellowships. Again, please follow up on uh, Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, and our Royal Kidney Academy page and, and WhatsApp group. Um, have a good afternoon. Have a good evening, everyone. And uh, see you next month in our next uh, webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>